what's that victory piece nina it's it's after two we probably ought to go all right let's get this thing going Bum, ba -dum, ba -da 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 -da. that's our theme song hello everybody and welcome to the scbwi inside story Yay! the biannual that means twice yearly celebration of new books by local authors and illustrators brought to you for 24 years by the Western Washington chapter of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, also known as SCBWI, the dumbest acronym in the world. I'm Dan Sullivan, a writer and illustrator of picture books and graphic novels. There's a little plug there. My co-host and raffle queen is Chrissy Wright, librarian at Sunset Elementary School in Isqua and book blogger. Not just book blogger, but uber book blogger. You got to check her out on our Instagram at Library Chrissy. So do that because it's a lot of fun. Our tech fair today is Karen Lewis. Dun, 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 dun. That's her running for her tech stuff. Uh, she's an author and illustrator of beautiful books, a world traveler, and singer in various kid lit punk bands. Kid luminary, graphic novel luminary and horse nut and she'll she'll tell you it's true Kristen varner uh will be our trivia queen and um doubling as our timer so she's the one you gotta watch out for giving everybody warnings whether a lot of two minutes or so are coming to an end we are not partnering with a bookstore this year but i am right now putting this this uh what's it called a program that's what it's called into the chat box it's a pdf an interactive pdf that you can you should download to your computer it, don't worry i didn't load it with any evil because it's a interactive and you can you can click on all the websites of all the presenters and go to their websites and find out more about them and their books and find out maybe how to buy their books which is really cool to buy books because when you buy their books, they can buy groceries. Then they can go back and write more books and you can read them. And it's this great circle of life. So, and it's, it sort of works. So, uh, so you, yeah, so do support your local library, not library books. Yeah, yeah libraries, it's course libraries and your bookstores uh, and not the one online with a big A um, to buy local books so yay books and bookstores yay librarians love them um there will be three books given away at the end of our session today but you must be present to win and uh chrissy wright will has a secret process by which she's going to pick them so you will get a chance to win three of the books that are presented today uh not just any book you can't say i want the oxford english dictionary no that's not going to work um, I'm grateful for you to being here. I really do appreciate you being here. We all might be getting a little zoomed out, but it is kind of cool when this technology works. And that technology tells me we have 159 people registered to watch today. And that's a lot of people. That's a that's record so far. So a little history, a little history. Inside Story began in 1998 when authors Laura McGee Kozlowski and George Shannon created a forum where authors and illustrators could celebrate their new titles with local booksellers, librarians, teachers, and other friends of children's books. It's been going strong ever since, and I am so proud to have been part of it for these last bunch of years. Um, but without further ado, or rather so without further ado, let's get going. First up, we have Beth Bacon, who's the author of the Panda Cub Swap. Beth was born in New England and has lived in five different states and three different countries. Some of her other books for children are I Hate Reading, The Book No One Wants to Read, and COVID-19 Helpers. Beth, who likes school, has an MFA in writing for children and young adults from Vermont College of Fine Arts, an, an MA in Communication Arts from New York University, and a BA in Literature from Harvard University. Let's hear something about how she wrote the Panda Cub Swap. Take it away, Beth. Hi, thanks for that intro, Dana. I'm Beth Bacon and my book is The Panda Cub Swap. And I have a question for you. 
Do you know how much work it is to take care of a baby panda? The answer is a lot. They are born with no fur, just pink skin. They are unable to see. They can't walk and have to be carried everywhere. And they even have to be massaged in order to go to the bathroom. So it's so much work that when um, a panda mama has babies, they can only take care of one of them at a time. So when Lun Lun, who lives at Zoo Atlanta, surprised everyone by having twins, the zoo staff had to pitch in. Every few hours, the keeper swapped out the cubs between Lun Lun and their workroom. The thing is, Lun Lun didn't know that she had twins and they weren't able to let her know until the cubs were four months old, old enough to walk. And no one knew how Lunlun would react when they all got together. I will leave you guys in suspense. You can get the book and find out what happens. Um, and there was another really special thing about this book. I didn't um, work on it the way normally you do because I, instead of just sending in the manuscript, Anne Belov, the illustrator, and I worked on it together and then we presented it to the publisher. So you will be able to hear from Anne right after this. Um, I love animal stories. Um, this is one about motherly love, which is great. And so check it out. And I think Anne is next. Absolutely. Next up, we have Ann Belov, who is the illustrator of the Panda Cub Swap. Now, Ann is a lifelong painter, printmaker, writer, and illustrator. To her, drawing pandas is almost as much fun as watching the panda cam, which she did a lot in the making of this book. You can find her in a house in the woods, happily hunting for her inner panda. Ann, tell us about your role in making the Panda Cub Swap. Well, my role in it came from being completely obsessed by pandas. So I met Beth mm, maybe eight years or so ago, and um, I was working on another book called Pandamorphosis, and she helped me edit it and design it. And then since she was in the middle of an MFA program for children, she said, hey, let's work on a book together. And I said, great, let's have it be about pandas. So um, people always want to know how I got obsessed about pandas. And um, it was a, a situation of pandas crossing my path at the right time. So, um, uh, you know, getting to work on a book about pandas was, um, was a real treat because it gave me a completely legitimate excuse for watching panda cams a lot. And, you know, people would say, aren't you watching the panda cams too much? And I'd say, well, I'm working here. So um, all of that eventually led to me drawing. I mean, I was already drawing cartoons about pandas and writing little stories about pandas. And then, of course, I had to go to China with a bunch of my panda loving friends. And um, I got to tell a joke to a panda. So this was at the um, Gengda Panda Base outside of Chengdu. And uh, because we were uh, affiliated with uh, Pandas International, um, uh, we got to volunteer with the pandas. And that's how I came to tell a joke to a panda. And tell me the joke you told that panda. The, the joke I told the panda was, what did the panda keeper say to the panda? And the answer is, are you trying to bamboozle me? <laughs> nice, nice, thank you, Ann. I love it. Next up, Carrie Kokaias wrote her newest book, A Person Can Be, because when she was a kid, she didn't have the vocabulary to identify all the things that she was. And because she's still learning about all the things she can be, her other books include You Might Be Special, Clever Haunts, The True Story of the Counting, Adding, and Time-Telling Horse, and Snow Sisters. She lives in Burien with her family and will now let us in on some inside story about a person can be. Yeah. Take it away, Carrie. 
Okay, hi. This is the cover of A Person Can Be. It's illustrated by Carrie Sukochev. Um, and I was just gonna share a little backstory about how the book came to be. Um, one day I was listening to Brene Brown's podcast, which is called Unlocking Us. And she was talking about um, kind of the juxtaposition between vulnerability and bravery and about how a person would never have the chance to be brave if they're not first afraid. And then shortly after that, I was kind of on social media looking at friends' posts and a friend of mine who um, was going through a divorce was posted a picture of herself and she tagged it alone, but not lonely. And so I think uh, seeing those two things around the same period in time got me really thinking about um, just the whole concept of how a person can be multiple, maybe seemingly contradictory things at the same time. And so um, I sat down and kind of started brainstorming, even just for myself before it was a book idea, just some of the, some ways that you can do multiple things at the same time. Um, and then as I got more and more, I thought, oh, I should make this into a kid's book. And I didn't want it to have very many more words than, than the phrases of what you can be, because I wanted the focus to really be on how, like for kids to really see that those seem opposite, but can be together. Um, so in order to make it into a story, I um, kind of went into the illustration notes and had the characters have like their own little story arc that happens in the illustrations. So um, the text is quite simple. Here's an example, Naughty and Nice, where the child is feeding the dog under the breakfast table. Um, and another one just to show is Busy and Bored. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping that this book will kind of help contribute to kids' social emotional learning and be a fun one to sit down with a parent and like really look into the details of the pictures and talk about what's going on and talk about what they might be feeling and how they can be multiple things at the same time. Awesome, thank you, Carrie. Next up we have Nina Layden. Nina is the author illustrator of The Trainbow. Now Nina's been making books for most of her life. She never expected to be making novelty board books in particular, but after the success of Pikachu, which has sold over a million copies during its 22 years in publication, here she is. The Trainbow is her latest and it combines Nina's love of trains, color and design in this small delightful package that you can both read and play with. Nina, tell us some more. Um, hey, thanks everybody for coming out on your Sunday to come to Inside Story. So yes, Trainbow is my new book, and I have always wanted to make a book that is an accordion fold book. And I thought that a train would be the perfect thing to put on an accordion fold. And I grew up in New York City, and the trains ran literally through my backyard. So when I started wanting to make this book, I started making dummies. And I made a tiny little black and white one like this. But then to send it to my publisher, Chronicle Books, I had to make it bigger. So I originally just made it on Bristol board, but then we started talking and decided that we thought the rainbow should become part of the book. And could we build the rainbow as the book opened and closed? But the designer I was working with was really young and she put the purple on top. And I said, no, the purple should never be on top of the rainbow. So this was the first little dummy that I made. And it turned out that my arches were too thin and we could never die cut that. So I made another one. And this time I decided that I would have the smoke from the train form the arches so the book could fold open and you could see the rainbow on both sides and it would be thick enough. And that did turn out to be the thing that worked so that we could build this book. And I have to do the art exact size and I made the art, it's a little bit behind me here, four feet long. So I painted the entire book each side and then I couldn't mail it. I had to literally drive it so that it could be scanned. And I am so happy that this book turned out the way it did and that kids can not only read the book but they can play with it. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. <laughs> That's great, you know, I love that. And, and I didn't know that purple couldn't be on top. It so can't I, be. Yeah, though the purple always is on the bottom in the spectrum. So next time you see a rainbow, look at it. <laughs> the red's on top. I promise. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Kristen, it's your turn. Sorry. Hey, everybody. Bringing you guys some uh, trivia today. All right. First trivia question is, which presenter has seen the childhood home? 
of Louisa May Alcott, Laura Ingalls Wilder, and Maya Angelou. Uh, first choice is Beth Bacon. Uh, second is Gretchen McClellan. And third, Craig Orbach. All right, get your answers in to the trivia, which is, and, all right, the answer is, -da 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 -da. yes, Beth Bacon. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Uh, next trivia is whose first car was a 61 VW bus, which she drove from Massachusetts to Seattle in 1979. First choice, Rachel Sumter. Second choice, Ann Bella. And third choice, Ellie Peterson. Who drove their 61 VW bus? Get your answer in. Oh my gosh, everybody is so good. And Bella with the, yeah, pulling in, and that is the correct answer. I can totally picture Anne driving her bug with like a hand on the back. Okay, um, third question. Third one. Yes, which presenter once ate a poisonous plant at the Denver Public Library? Ooh. Was it Karina Lucan? Was it Johnny Sensel? Or Carrie Kakaias. I want to know what that poisonous plant was. Um, and they didn't die because they're with us today. Uh, ooh, it's looking like a um, near even split, but again, audience is on it with their trivia questions. The, the correct answer is Carrie. And we're all dying to know what that plant is. Number four. Which presenter went to the Oscars in six inch stilettos? Was it Suma, Subramaniam? Was it Nina Layden or Carrie? <laughs> and oh my gosh, again, audience has it correct. It was indeed Nina. <laughs> what color were they, Nina? Were they red? I'm guessing they're red. They were black. <laughs> All right, see you guys in a bit. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Darren. Uh, next up, Karina Lucan is the author illustrator of The Tree in Me, as well as the New York Times bestseller, My Heart, and The Book of Mistakes, which has been praised by Entertainment Weekly, The Wall Street Journal, NPR, and more. And she is the author of Patchwork, written by Matt De La Pena, as well as Something Good and Adrian Simcox Does Not Have a Horse, Nothing in Common, and Weird Little Robots. She lives near the Salish Sea in Olympia, Washington, with her husband, daughter, and two small cats. <clears throat> Let's hear her inside story about patchwork. Hi, everyone. So I'm Karina Lucan, and I'm here to talk to you today about this book, Patchwork, which is my latest collaboration. It was written by Matt De La Pena and just came out this fall. And I wanted to show you a couple fun things about this book. So that starting with the end papers. So these are the front end papers for the book. And these are the back end papers. And each of these squares of color represents one of the characters in the book. Um, and as their story moves along through the book, their, um, their squares of color change and grow, as you can see. So um, what I also wanted to show you though, a little fun thing, is that each, each child's story begins with a single square of color. So this is our first kid who begins with blue. And as the story goes on, other colors are introduced. So we get pink and then we get brown but also each child's story is connected to the story of the kids that um, the child that follows them. So here in this beginning sequence for the blue story, we have a girl who becomes our dancer. And as our dancer grows up to be um, a coder, if you look really close at her desk, she has a picture of a child who is, our basketball player, which is the orange here. So this character here, the basketball player, is actually based on Matt De La Pena, um, basketball player turned poet. 
uh, turned writer. And again, in this sequence, we have, we have the back of a girl's head and she um, is our class clown. So that continues on throughout the whole book. So it's sort of a fun thing you can look for is finding each child that is hidden within the story of the kid before them. And that is Patchwork. Wonderful. Next up today, we have Vikram Madan. So Vikram used to be a techie and now he creates children's books and I'll let you guess which one he likes more. Today, he's here to bring us two fall releases. He's gonna tell us about Owl and Penguin, which he both wrote and illustrated, as well as Bobo and Pup Pup, the funny book, which he wrote. Vikram, take it away. Hi, everybody. So uh, one of my two books is Bobo and Pup Pup, the funny book. This is the third book in the series. And the series is actually pretty personal to me. The first book was inspired by my kids, the second book by my mom. And this one's inspired by my brother, so I grew up in uh, India and our childhood was very uh, free of uh, any forms of entertainment. So we were perpetually bored and always hungry for the next new book. Uh, and anytime we got a book, uh, a book came home, my brother and I would kind of, uh, you know, fight over it to see who was going to read it first. I remember one time I thought I won the fight and I was hiding behind the couch, reading the book uh, happily by myself. And suddenly when I turned the page, I heard this voice over my shoulder saying, stop, don't turn the page, I'm still reading it. Um, and turned out my brother had climbed over the couch and was reading the book over my shoulder. And that directly inspired this book. So uh, in this book, the character, the dog character, Pup Pup, has a funny book that he's really enjoying. And Bobo, the monkey, is a little bit impatient. And so the whole book is about uh, how... Bobo tries to read the book before it's his turn. And so it's about sharing and caring and, you know, uh, figuring out how to compromise with friends. So a fun little book. Uh, the second book is uh, Owl and Penguin. And I wrote and illustrated this. And the backstory from this is this was inspired by a painting. Uh, I saw a painting of a rabbit foot by another artist. And I thought I would do something similar. And I painted a penguin. And next thing I knew, uh, the penguin was a popular series and I painted these guys, an owl and a penguin. And um, eventually an editor looked at my website and said, have you thought about doing a story for them? And so I gave her a picture book dummy, she hated it. The whole idea fell flat, but a sketch inside that dummy inspired me to think about, could this be a graphic novel with the two wordless characters? And so I created this graphic novel. It doesn't have any words in it. it, went on circulation. The editor said, let's add some words. And the end result is a book that's perfect for beginning readers, struggling readers, emerging readers, pre-readers, anybody who just wants to gain confidence in reading. So check them both out. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Vikram. Uh, when you're done, you're done. Um, next up, and, and I love your drawings. And you didn't tell us which one you love most, and then, and that's that's a good author. You don't do that. Gretchen McClellan is a former reading specialist and author of five picture books. She spent her childhood in one of America's oldest and nearly invisible subcultures, a modern nomadic culture, the military. She provides a mirror for kids like her by giving them a voice in her recent release, When Your Daddy's a Soldier, by providing a window into their world. She hopes to build understanding and compassion for them and their families. She also writes middle grade fiction about this subculture. Let's hear from Gretchen about When Your Daddy's a Soldier. Hello, everybody. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for being here today, too. You know, we talk a lot about being able to see ourselves in books, but often the most profound experience is when you do not see yourself anywhere in a book, because that experience can catalyze you writing a book where you actually can find yourself. I had that experience with when I was young in the mountains, Cynthia Ryland's beautiful book. In this book, there is this intensely beautiful sense of, of place, of intergenerational belonging and of home. All those things I never had as an army brat, always one set of orders away from being, um, from moving and saying goodbye to everything that I knew. So in Ryland's story, what I found was my own intense desire to belong, 
So what did I do? I wrote a book. I, as a counterpoint, I wrote when I was young in the army and I included things like how my mom had to line up her diaper pail and stand at attention at the end of her bed in the military maternity ward for an actual inspection. No kidding. So it started really young. Um, so I fast forward a number of years and it's Veterans Day and my heart is just being torn apart thinking about all the military families whose moms and dads were deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I put my pen to paper and this entire story came out. And in this story, I hope kids will find a home for their heart. Um, you know, military kids don't have a physical home. They don't have a hometown, but they can find a place where their heart belongs. And in this story, I wanted to give them that sense of belonging, of having their feelings acknowledged and of being heard. Um, it was purchased as an own voices story and it was extremely important to the editor that the illustrator also be um, or have military family. So E.K. Um, e E.G. Keller has that. We created a story about family love that I hope creates a sense of compassion for those, for people who serve. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Gretchen. Next up today, we have Craig Orbach. Craig is the illustrator of more than 20 books for kids. These include Born to Draw Comics, Gifts from the Enemy, and The Can Man. He has also taught children's book illustration for 20 years. Uh, when he's not illustrating, Craig also loves to share his books with kids during school visits and library visits, and he's currently based in Everett. Let's hear from Craig about his latest called Starring Steven Spielberg, The Making of the Young Filmmaker. All right, here's the book here. Um, it is uh, written by Jean Beretta, who's a, a well-known author illustrator. After illustrating Born to Draw Comics, the story of Charles Schultz and the creation of Peanuts for editor Christy Ottaviano, she said she was open to other picture ideas, biography ideas. In early 2018, after brainstorming many subjects, uh, she loved my idea of a biography on Steven Spielberg, uh, the film director. As a child of the 1970s and 80s, I grew up on Spielberg uh, movies, seeing films like Raiders of the Lost Ark and E.T. and Empire of the Sun in theaters are uh, wonderful memories that have stuck with me. I read a biography and learned that as a child, he was making his own movies in the Southwest desert with his friends near Phoenix, Arizona in the 1950s and 60s. Luckily, he had parents that supported him and his artistic ambitions. Many of his childhood interests like aliens from outer space and World War II were the subject matter of his early films as well as, as his later big Hollywood blockbusters. In 2019, I made a week-long trip to Phoenix to see the location of many of his childhood movies, as well as his elementary and high school and his family home. Exploring this area added a lot of authenticity and enjoyment to the project. So if you look at the end papers of the book, you'll see a lot of the original drawings that I did of location stuff. <clears throat> and then um, I also rewatched all of his movies for inspiration for compositions and lighting for my art. For the illustrations, I originally sketched out the drawings in pencil and then made a transition to working digitally for the final color art. I used the program Procreate on my iPad in Photoshop. When we were close to finishing the book, I learned that Steven Spielberg had decided to write and direct his own autobiographical movie about his childhood. The movie is called The Fablemans, and it's coming out on Thanksgiving Day, and I'm incredibly excited to see it. He didn't, he didn't in, uh, ask for my uh, advice, though, unfortunately. And <laughs> I like to think that we beat him to his own story by starting our book before his movie, which is true. He started two years later. Anyway, I wanted to show you one other thing. I bought a little uh, camera. This is the first camera that he ever used to make one of his childhood movies, uh, the first movie he ever did which was a scene of uh, trains crashing. So I just wanted to show that really, this really quick. So I use this, I bought it off of eBay and then there's the image in the book. So 
anyway, thank you so much. I hope you guys get a chance to read the book and see the movie. It's a great double feature. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much. Now we'll go back to our trivia queen, Kristen Berner. All right. Hello, folks. I'm back. All right. Our next trivia question is um, number five. Which presenter broke their collarbone helping a friend prepare for their Aikido brown belt test? Huh. Was it number one, Ann Bella? Two, Rachel Sumter? Or three, Karina Lucan? Who broke their collarbone helping their friend? And Rachel or Karina? Get those answers in. Wow, audience shining again. That is the correct answer. Karina is the right one. She broke her collarbone. All right. Trivia six. Uh, which presenter used to be a techie, but now creates children's books? Number one, Vikram Madan, Beth Bacon for number two, or three, Will Taylor, who was the techie nerd in their previous life? Hey. Yes, the, I, the audience was listening. Yes, Vikram is the right answer. So, our former techie. All right, let's see. We got... Seven, okay. Which presenter traveled on a military troop ship from the US to Germany as a nine-year-old? Was it A, Trudy Truitt, two, uh, B, Craig Orbach, or C, Gretchen McClellan? This could be a trick question, people. <laughs> that is correct. The correct answer is Gretchen. <laughs> and let's see, our last one. Trivia eight, which presenter was terrified of sharks and the ocean thanks to Jaws while growing up on the coast of California? Was it one, Craig Orbach, two, Beth Bacon, or three, Trudy Truitt? I think I was also in that category of being terrified from Jaws. I, I didn't want to take a bath in my own bathtub. <laughs> yeah, I know, swimming it's, it was bad. The swimming pool was terrifying too. And that is correct. It, it was indeed, it is indeed Craig. And I don't know if Craig is still terrified of swimming in the ocean. He's given us, he's given us the head shake. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Smart man. Thanks, Craig. Um, next up, and thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Uh, next up, Ellie Peterson, who is the author and illustrator of multiple picture books, including How to Hug a Pufferfish and school is wherever I am. Her work is inspired by 20 years as a classroom teacher and her experience growing up as a biracial army brat. When she's not in the classroom, you can find her making art in her backyard studio or exploring the beautiful Pacific Northwest where she lives. Let's hear Ellie's inside story on writing and illustrating school is wherever I am. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by taking a little trip back in time, all the way back to Friday, March 13th, 2020. If you'd picked up the Seattle Times that day, you would have seen on the front page, Inslee Order Shuts Down Schools. At this time, I was a science teacher at a K independent school in Seattle. And up to that point, I had spent 18 years coming to my classroom, shuffling chairs and desks, setting up the day's activities and experiments, and listening to and watching my students interact with each other. Everything changed for me and for them that day, I'm sure for you as well. Um, we transitioned quickly to a remote program using Zoom like we are now to teach our students. So no more labs, no more in-person activities, no more voices of students in the hallway. Um, I found myself mourning for my students and the experience that they were not having with me, um, the things that they were not able to do as a result of the pandemic. However, a couple months into our remote learning experience, a friend shared with me a quote by um, Teresa Thayer Snyder, who was the former superintendent for public schools in New York. And she said, when the children return to school, they will have returned with a new history. When the children return to school, we will need to listen to them. Let their stories be told. Remember, their brains did not go into hibernation this year. 
their brains may not have been focused on traditional school material, but they did not stop either. And I realized in that moment that my students' brains had not been idle. They were having learning experiences outside of school that were just as valid. And it was that realization that inspired this look, can you see it there? Okay. <laughs> in fact, my own family had been having incredible, amazing learning adventures and discoveries outside of this uh, school experience, which were incredibly enriching and that I was thankful for. And some of these even made it into the book, which are the side-by-sides that you see around me right now. Um, a lot of teachers have been reaching out about this book being a great read aloud to prepare for field trips and to remind students why we take learning outside the classroom. And it's also been really embraced by the homeschooling community as well. I hope you will check it out. Thank you. Thanks, Ellie. Next today we have Brianna Kaplan Sayers. Brianna is the author of Where Do Diggers Take Vacation? Uh, now, as a teacher, she used to tell her second graders, when I grow up, I'm going to be a writer. And while she's not totally sure about the having grown up part, lo and behold, here she is with us today and she's a writer. Awesome. Her first picture book, Where Do Diggers Sleep at Night, has now become a best-selling series. So today she's going to tell us about the latest book in the series, Where Do Diggers Take Vacation? Hi, so today I'm supposed to tell you about where do diggers take vacation, um, but I'm actually going to travel back in time uh, to 2012. And in 2012, I was presenting at in my very first inside story about where do diggers sleep at night. Um, it was at Mockingbird Books, and I had just moved back home uh, to Seattle from New Jersey, and I was sort of terrified, and I didn't know any of the fellow presenters because I just moved here, and this was my first book. And I had no idea that Where Did Diggers Sleep at Night would grow into this best-selling series with more than a million copies in print. And I'm so very grateful and honored that it has, and that my editor asked me to write. Uh, my wonderful editor asked... Random House asked me to write Where Do Diggers Take Vacation? Um, but there's a challenge because there's a lot of books in this series and I'm always trying to make each one special, individual and unique. And so when I do this, I'm really excited to put in new trucks and the the uh, firefight firefighting trucks made their water slide park. And um, I recently went on some camping trips and I was excited that the drill rigs took a camping trip too. We had some ice cream trucks in here, a recycling truck, and I was super excited that we had a safari truck in here. So always trying to put new trucks and make each book exciting and fun for the kids. And I'm also very excited to tell everybody just a little inside story about the book that Christian Slade, the book's magnificent illustrator, in the very first book, you won't find a mouse hidden on each page because they hadn't come up with the idea yet. But in every book in the series after that, you'll find a little mouse hidden on each page. And the mouse, I don't know if you can see it, but there's that little teeny mouse that is so much fun to find. So I hope you and your little ones have fun with the diggers taking vacations. And thank you all so very much. Thank you, Brianna. I love that. I remember that that first your first inside story, and uh, thinking, "Oh, that'll never sell." Ah, no, I didn't really think that, but so so glad. Uh, moving on, Johnny Sensel is the author, our former regional advisor for SCBWI, by the way. Johnny Sensel is the author of eight books for young readers and more than a dozen for adults. Her kids' books include a Junior Library Guild selection, a Center for Children's Books Best Book, and a Henry Berg Honor Title. She holds an MFA in writing from Vermont College of Fine Arts and served for four years as co-regional advisor for SCBW Western Washington. Boy, you'd think I would have read that beforehand. She lives at the knees of Mount Rainier in Washington State with her dog and assorted wildlife. And now she's going to tell us something about writing a curse on the wind. Thank you, Dana. Yes, this is A Curse on the Wind, kind of a spooky cover. And the story of this book goes back quite a while. In 2013, I moved to Springfield, Ohio. And before I left, I went online to Google a little bit about Springfield and found a number of references to it being the armpit of Ohio. So my hopes weren't great when I got there. But when I got to Springfield, I discovered that it once had... Um, a huge heyday in the late 1800s and early 1900s and they had a really good history museum 
with all kinds of things in it, referencing um, the 10 automobile factories that were once there and the early movie production houses that were there and the stop on the Underground Railroad. And the city had a great historical cemetery called Ferncliff. And one of the things that sparked my interest the most in the museum was it, the city was where one of the first burglar proof caskets for burying people was patented. And I couldn't turn that one down. Um, so all these things are sort of bubbling around in the back of my head as an idea. And at that point in my life, I had recently been in a place where I sort of thought love was out of reach and I had kind of given up on that idea and then discovered to my surprise that there is true love out there. And, and uh, I was wrong about that. So that sort of became the under the covers emotional through line for A Curse on the Wind. I started writing the book in 2014. My graduate school advisor hated it. Um, I put it down and picked it back up again multiple times over the next few years. And finally, here it is as a completed book. And I think the moral of the story of A Curse on the Wind is that true love is out there. Persistence helps because sometimes it takes a long time. And even an armpit can be inspirational. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the armpit inspo. Next up today, we have Suma Subramaniam. Suma's interests as an author are centered primarily around STEM related topics and also India and Indian heritage. Uh, when Suma is not recruiting by day or writing by night, she is also volunteering with We Need Diverse Books and with SCBWI. She lives in Seattle with her family and with a dog who likes to watch baking shows. Suma is going to tell us about her two recent releases, Namaste is a Greeting, and She Sang for India. Over to you, Suma. Thank you, Chrissy. Hello, everybody. My name is Suma Subramaniam, and I'm the author of Namaste is a Greeting, and She Sang for India. And here's the inside story for both of these books. Um, you know, having lived in beautiful Seattle for well over a decade now, I'm embedded in both the Indian as well as the American culture and often embracing one comes at the expense of the other. And I constantly see children from India and the diaspora struggle with the complex dichotomy of issues related to identity, adolescence and becoming multifaceted personalities. And when I ask myself how I can help them, the answer is through writing impactful and empowering children's books that will resonate with children who are from India and the diaspora, and that will also serve as windows and mirrors for those who do not have lived experience from my culture. So with that said, Namaste is, Namaste is a Sanskrit greeting. Namaha is salutation and Te means to you. The purpose of writing this book is to help readers acknowledge its true meaning. The divine in me honors the divine in you. So this book is not about religion, but it's a simple story about a child who sees the divine in everyone and in everything and ties it all together with empathy and mindfulness. And one of the most powerful aspects of such diverse friendships is the hope that it brings in times of adversity. So it's about paying attention to words in our culture and also those outside our own and use them with conscientious empathy. My second book, is She Sang for India, a picture book biography about the first Indian musician who performed at the United Nations and who was known as an advocate for justice and peace through song. I listened to MS Subhulakshmi's music all of my life and I grew up listening to her voice first thing in the morning almost every day of my childhood. And her songs are played in the homes of millions of people from India and uh, all over the world, including mine. And I want readers to take away from MS Subhulakshmi two values that I learned from her. One is to create a habit of consistent learning and practice in our area of interest. And second is to have the humility and courage to share our work for the good of the world. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you check these both books out. Thank you, Suma. And now back. All right, we got more trivia coming your way, everybody. <laughs> Trivia number nine, which presenter made a different origami animal each day for 100 days in a row during the pandemic? Was it number one, Ann Bellog, 
Number two, Ellie Peterson, or number three, Will Taylor, who got their origami on during the pandemic. And the audience is really scoring well today, you guys. I'm so impressed. That is correct. It was Ellie Peterson doing origami for 100 days. That's so impressive. Um, Which presenter? once took part in a department store swimwear pageant wearing a yellow bikini. Was it Carrie Kakayev, Rachel Sumter, or Johnny Sensel? Who was in the swimwear pageant? No, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's just, this is great. It, the answer is correct. It was Johnny. And I will say that she does want everybody to know that she was in the first grade. <laughs> <laughs> that pageant. <laughs> there we go. Which presenter has a second name that means the goddess of victory? Is it Suma Subramaniam, or is it Nina Layden, or Ellie Peterson? Second name meaning goddess of victory. That's right. Ninety-four percent for Suma. Yep, that is correct. Right. Ellie Peter, you know Peterson sounds really strong too, but it's not quite goddess of victory. Um, Rachel Sumter is an illustrator whose work has been featured in the New York Times, Penguin Random House Books, McSweeney's, and the Boston Globe, oh, and Bloomberg Magazine. She's also an art professor and lives in Seattle in a tiny house with an overgrown garden, a Siamese cat named Lucy, and a chicken named Sunny. Now let's hear about Rachel's third picture book with Cameron Kids, Birthday of the World. Thank you for having me today. Um, <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about The Birthday of the World, which was written by author Rachel Naomi Lemon, um, who also wrote the book uh, Kitchen Table Wisdom. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but she's a doctor that's really involved in helping people heal from um, cancer and children that have to leave go to the hospital for various reasons. But um, she, I was asked to illustrate this at the very, um, at the tail end of the pandemic after I had already just illustrated two picture books for Cameron. And I was very apprehensive about taking any more projects on with teaching full time at the same level. But I read the story and just fell in love with it. It's about, um, it's a story about uh, her as a child and her father, who was um, a rabbi, and he would tell her this story on her fourth birthday about the birthday of the, of the world and how um, the light, there's a light that is born in everyone when you are born and um, that the light inside of you grows um, and the light also can be in things like birds and trees um, and uh, I started it off set in New York City because that's where she was raised when she was a child and um, in the winter and then uh, it progressively gets um, like warmer and sunnier so springtime this is an ode to um, to I Am a Bunny. I don't know if you know that book by Richard Scarry, but this is sort of like a little ode to that because that that um, picture book kind of has a, a very similar tone where it's all about friendship and finding the beauty and love in one another and helping that grow um, and bringing the light out in each 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 person that you meet by by sharing kindness and love. So that seemed like a good thing <laughs> at the end of the pandemic. That's the perfect message for World Kindness Day. Thank you, yeah, Rachel. Exactly, thank you so much. Next up today, we have Will Taylor. Will is a middle grade author. He's a reader and apparently he's a honeybee fan. He lives in the heart of downtown Seattle where you can find him when he's not writing. He might be searching for the perfect bakery. Yum. He might be talking to trees in parks. Sounds fun. Or he could be losing his mind when he meets long-haired dash hounds. 
Uh, he's the author of three previous middle grade novels, and he's here today to share about his two newest releases, Catch That Dog and The Language of Seabirds. Over to you, Will. Yay, thank you. I want to start by apologizing for disappearing every few minutes. I'm making bread, and the second proof took twice as long as it was supposed to, so it literally just came out of the oven, and I was so worried the timer was going to go off like right now. Um, so thank you, everyone, for your patience as I disappear. I'm sure no one noticed, but I felt bad about it, so I wanted to apologize. Um, I'm Will. I write middle grade. Uh, up until this last summer, all my books have been bouncy and silly. Uh, never ending, Maggie and Abby's Never Ending Pillow Fort was my first one. Secret Network of Pillow Forts that only kids can get into. And the sequel, Maggie and Abby in the Shipwreck Treehouse, just escalating from uh, pillow forts to treehouses, plus summer camp. And uh, Palaces of Europe, randomly enough. And chickens, lots of chickens. Then was uh, Slimed, which was uh, my Goosebumps tribute uh, under my pen name that I will explain some other time uh, about fourth graders who accidentally turn all the grownups into slime zombies and have to fight an evil Bill Nye to get control of their town again. Uh, but everything uh, with the pandemic delayed, Slimed was a year delayed by the pandemic and Catch That Dog came out this last June instead of last April. This was uh, yeah my fourth book, also a romp comedy. I call this one a comedy because of Winn-Dixie. Simple. It's about a girl and a dog. It's based on true events, 1953 New Jersey, the world's most famous poodle, and everything that went wrong. Super fun. Uh, just kind of a classic girl and her dog story. My big book is The Language of Seabirds. This is my first non-comedy. It's a contemporary middle school romance between two boys, um, just halfway between 12 and 13. Simple hook. It's Heartstopper in middle school. And they come up with a secret code to be able to tell each other how they feel using bird names. And that's that's how that started. Um, it's been a weird time to put out a middle grade queer romance, to be honest. It's been a strange, strange experience getting a lot of silence from schools, but um, you know, we do what we can. And uh, let's look at my first start reviews. I'm super proud of this one. This seems like this might be the way my career is heading in future. Um, I, I got it, I sped through everything. Um, I'm on sub again, that's really fun and not at all nerve wracking. I'm um, also working on a book about baking spies, uh, 11th or 12th century uh, escape mystery, a uh, musical YA based on Agatha Christie's Poirot. And um, thank you all for coming on a Sunday. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Will. Uh, by the way, when he says he's on sub, he's not a substitute teacher. He's submitting, I think he means he's submitting books right now. And uh, well, I think you ought to just, you know, take those those uh, school visit requests for Catch That Dog and bring the language of seabirds and just put it in their face. Okay, next up we have Trudy Truitt, who has written more than 100 books. Yes, 100 books for young readers. She's the first author to pen, I mean, you know, she's actually published. I mean, who hasn't written 100 books? But she's published 100 books. Okay, enough about that. She is the first author to pen fiction for National Geographic, and her best-selling Explorer Academy series was a Barnes & Noble Best Books for Young Readers' Choice and an Amazon Prime box subscription service selection and a Washington State Book Award finalist. Trudy and her photographer husband, Bill, he's so dreamy, <laughs> live to serve the whims of their four diva cats. Let's hear about Trudy's seventh National Geographic Explorer Academy novel, The Forbidden Island. Yay! Oh, thanks, Dana. Oh, yes, he is. My husband is dreamy, so thanks for that. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, this is The Forbidden Island, and it's the seventh and final book in the set, so it completes a year in the life of the characters. Um, the series, if you know anything about it, it's inspired by the real explorers of National Geographic and I began writing it about six years ago, and at the time I figured that most of my research would be done through reading articles from the explorers or watching their speaking events, but along the way um, I've been able to interview them, and so I've met some amazing scientists. I've met uh, a female submarine pilot, she's one of only handful, uh, one of a handful in the world, and I've met a renowned paleontologist who discovered a previously unknown dinosaur species, and a biologist who collects animal venoms for use in human medications. And they've all accomplished amazing and groundbreaking things. But when I was thinking back about them as a whole, 
the first word that comes to mind is fun. They're energetic, passionate scientists doing what they love. And that's what I tried to infuse in Explore Academy because I want readers to understand that um, science is fascinating and it's alive and it's fun. And so that's um, what Explore Academy is really all about. It's about students traveling the world, learning about themselves and learning about the world. Now, this is the last book in the set, because if you've been coming to um, Inside Story for a while, you know that I show up every year and I talk about Explorer Academy, but it's not the end of the adventure. We're going to continue on with the Explorer's second year at the Academy, and the focus will shift to another major character who is revealed at the end of this book. So um, if you read the seventh book in the series, you can stay tuned for a new series coming in 2024. And I just want to take a minute to, to thank everyone for reading. Uh, the series has been translated into over 20 languages, so I get mail from readers and parents and educators around the world, and it's really been an, an amazing experience. And I'm glad that there's more to come, so thanks everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Trudy. To close us out today, next we have Janet Wong. Janet is a picture book author and a poet. She's recently back in the Pacific Northwest, hooray, and she's eager to reconnect with all her Washington kidlet friends. These days when she's not writing, Janet is also focused on offering writing workshops and she's creating fundraiser books with Sylvia Vardell for the IBBY Children in Crisis Fund. Today we're going to hear from Janet as she shares about her latest book of poetry, What is a Friend? Thank you. And gosh, it has been years since I've done an inside story, but way back in 1999 or 2000, I think that was my first inside story for The Rainbow Hand, poems about mothers and children, or Behind the Wheel, um, poems about driving, and it feels so good to be back in this community. Well, my first 21 books were published by big publishers like Simon & Schuster, Harcourt, Candlewick. But then 10 years ago, Sylvia Bardell, who was then a professor of children's literature, said, why don't we create anthologies, anthologies that that put brand new emerging poets right next to established poets. And so that's what we've been doing. We, we formed a company called Pomelo Books, P-O-M-E-L-O books.com. And you can see all of our books there, including What is a Friend, the latest. The latest books, the latest handful of books are all fundraisers for IBI. IBI is the... Um, the children's literature version of the United Nations. And uh, this year uh, they are donating money to help children in, in Ukraine. And 100% of our profits for our last handful of books uh, have gone to Ibi. Also, the last several books have all been ekphrastic poetry. So photographs and poems, poems about all kinds of things. Uh, by all kinds of poets. This book has 41 poets. Uh, it's for older kids. We have books for younger kids, illustrated uh, ekphrastic poetry um, for, uh, for preschool. Take a look at pomelobooks.com, the new books section. And thank you for being here. It feels so good to be back with you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Janet. And now, um, all right. Coming to you guys with our last trivia question of the day. Which presenter won first prize for the smallest hat category during their third grade crazy hat day? Was it Craig Orbach, Karina Lucan, or Rachel Sumter? Who won smallest hat? Yes. And yet again, yes, the correct answer is Rachel for her tiny hat. Right. Which presenter once bartended with Lance Bass from NSYNC for a night? Was it Will Taylor, Gretchen McClellan, or Ann Belov? Who got to bartend with boy bander Lance Bass? Yikes. Will, Gretchen, or Ann? All right, yes, the resounding 81%. That's correct. It was Will. Hi, hey, Will. What's your about that, Will? Really? <laughs> Next. Number 15, which presenter hosted a late night jazz show on KNKX, formerly KPLU? Was it Beth Bacon, Will Taylor, or Trudy Truitt? 
Same, that's same. right. Yep. That's the winner, Trudy, our, our jazz expert. Awesome. And our last trivia of today, I believe. Which presenter was featured in a Remembering Your Spirit segment on Oprah? Ooh, was it Gretchen McClellan, Janet Wong, or Carrie Kakaya? And 100% for Janet. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Great job with yeah. you today, you guys. Great people in the like chat, right people who are paying it. People paying attention have been have noted that question eleven got skipped. Are you willing to give us question eleven? Well, I'll try. Um, they really are paying attention. Oh, you know what? It's question ten. It's um, question no, ten I, got skipped. I think this is it. It's it's um, that's right. Which presenter is proud to have portaged a canoe during a recent backcountry canoe trip? Was it Brianna, Kaplan Sayers, Karina Lucan, or Janet Wong? That's right, it's strong woman, Brianna Kaplan Sayers. Yeah. Listen, her canoe. Awesome. This is the part where we get to give away some of their books, hooray. So you have to be present to win during this live session. Um, if I call your name, please go ahead and type something like I'm here in the chat box to confirm your status as a winner. Um, and then you'll send an email to Dana and he will work with you to purchase the book of your choice by one of our authors here today from an independent bookstore. So first off, I have David Lasky. David, are you here? Next one on my list. Next, I have Megan Porter. Megan, are you here? I'm here in the chat. Okay, let's go to the next one on my list. I have Trisha Snyder. Trisha, are you here? Cool. I look forward to hearing from you and we'll figure out how to get you your books. I thought for a minute they wouldn't have to give away any books because I disabled the chat somehow. I don't know how. All right, back to my script. Um, thank you, Chrissy, that was a great job. Uh, thank you, everybody who's been helping me out. Thank you, all of you, for being here. Sending out an enormous shout out of thanks to Holly Huckabee. This is Holly Huckabee. She is our regional advisor of our Western Washington chapter of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrator. And uh, Holly's been a shining beacon of literary hope during these pandemic times, offering more and more classes, programs, opportunities, and sometimes donuts. To our Pacific Northwest corner of the Kidlet world, SCBWI has been putting on a lot of excellent programming, which you can see at scbwi.org. And Holly's been leading the way to increase our membership diversity and inclusion of authors of all voices. If you've got a book inside and you're struggling to get out, go to scbwi.org and join today. Um, this is my last time hosting and organizing the Inside Story. So you may all be wondering, who is taking over? Well, we're going to answer that question right here, right now. I've got the wheel of, uh, of names right here. And everybody who's been registered to, to come in to, to view this is in my wheel. And we're going to pick the next host and organizer of the inside story. And the beauty of this plan is you do not have to be present to win. And when you registered, there was some fine print saying, yes, you would do this job. So it's wonderful for me, but enough talk. Let's see who's gonna do it. Spinning the wheel, spinning the wheel. And the answer is, who, who? Ellen Maddox. Yay, Ellen! I'll be in touch with you, and you get your uh, your gold Rolls Royce. I don't think you guys knew I get that, um, and uh, in the in the mail. And then uh, we'll just talk about how you're going to take over this thing, and we'll talk next uh, in six months. <laughs> To let me know that she will take over the job of host of Inside Story. Island is a 
illustration student of Rachel Sumters at Seattle Pacific University. And in further good news, the dream team of Chrissy, Karen, and Kristen are sticking around to help her. So yay, that's fabulous. We're in great hands and we'll follow up on this later. Thanks. Let's read, it, read it, check out everybody's websites and books and then buy some books. Hire our presenters to come to your school, read books to kids, whatever you can, and keep kids lit thriving. On behalf of the Western Washington chapter of SCBWI, and my team, Chrissy Wright, Karen Lewis, and Kristen Barner, thank you, everybody. This has been the Inside Story of November 2022, and we are done, and thank you, and goodbye. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Now I'm going to end this webinar in. Thanks, Dana. Oh, oh, keep going. No, I'm going to end this in three, two, one. Good night.